This series is part of uh, our year-long project this year called Catching Up With Life, uh, which is organized around a question. As social structures evolve and their values and rituals change, how is architecture keeping up? So talking about family quickly becomes talking about society and social definitions underlie most political positions. So family can even be a divisive word. For example, family values is a loaded term that's often used by politicians to activate anxieties about social change. Invoking the family can be used to build a dynamic of inside and outside, private and public, native and foreign. And these images are common today in the political discourse of many countries, in part because we're facing global challenges and struggling whether to face them together or to take care of our own first. And the idea of family as a microcosm for society is itself problematic. In other ways, there have always been many kinds of families, but only some were sanctioned by legal systems or celebrated in art, literature, film, or television. And yet today, especially in the West, we do live with the 20th century social and physical inheritance based on the myth of the nuclear family. Meanwhile, society and architecture are transforming at different rates, and parts of contemporary life are becoming misaligned with the spaces they occupy. The acceptance of a greater variety of family configurations is one of the easier changes to identify, but it's still a blur, as the architect Naomi Stead writes. What used to seem progressive becomes commonplace. What was daring becomes tame. What was queer becomes ordinary. Such are the processes of normalization, and such processes calcify in architectural form. So in this series, we're hearing from experts on historical encounters between architecture and ideas of the family, and these case studies or moments of clarity will be followed by other talks that survey the contemporary environment for evidence of new or extended families. And we began the series with the invention of the family room, something like ground zero for the nuclear family. And today we're gonna to hear about boarding houses, the antithesis to the bourgeois home of the 19th century and about the de debates around them. So joining us live from Bloomington, Indiana, we have Wendy Gamber. She's chair and the Burns professor at the Department of History at Indiana University. Among many publications, she's the author of The Boarding House in 19th Century America and The Notorious Mrs. Clem. One of her current research projects is a history of household hazards. So thank you for joining us and over to you, Wendy. I'm really delighted to be here and I love to talk about boarding houses because I find them absolutely fascinating um, for the very reasons that Lev described. So I'm going to do the obligatory sharing my screen. So uh, first of all, some definitions. Uh, boarding houses were places that provided food, lodging, and housekeeping services in exchange for cash. They were extraordinarily common in the 19th century United States. In fact, social historians have estimated that between a third and a half of 19th century urban residents uh, took either took in borders or were border, borders themselves. Uh, and this was also common in rural areas, suburban areas, perhaps a little less easy to quantify, but boarding was extraordinarily common. And while contemporaries thought and often spoke of the boarding house as an American institution, it was common, not just in the United States, but in the UK, Europe and Canada um, as well. Though I'm gonna be talking about the US because I'm a US historian. You might think of boarding houses as looking like this. And this is indeed a boarding house. This is a corporate boarding house built at the Lowell Mills in Massachusetts. But most boarding houses were not like this. They were not purpose built. They were simply houses that had extra rooms to rent. Um, so here, for example, is the so-called House of Genius, just before it was torn down at, um, in Washington Square in Greenwich Village. And it was called the House of Genius because Stephen Crane and Willa Cather and other famous writers lived there. And despite uh, the efforts of preservationists, it was torn down. But people didn't want to preserve it because it was a boarding house. They wanted to preserve it because of who lived there. So in terms of architecture, here I'm a fraud. There was very little that was architecturally distinct about boarding houses. And I, because of that, 
I think what I'm going to be doing is describing a history of architectural loss. Very few of the structures I'll be describing have been preserved, and I don't even know necessarily what they looked like. And this is also um, a story of what I might call the architecture of imagination, uh, because boarding houses were the subject of a lively popular culture. Um, humorists in particular described cramped bed cha chambers, soiled linens, dirty carpets, bed bugs. Uh, here's the dirty boarding house from Thomas Butler Gunn's Physiology of New York Boarding Houses. Uh, and here the landlady is uh, depicted um, as a as a pig, um, nothing subtle about these, uh, these depictions. Nosy neighbors, how my maiden neighbors learned my secrets, and questionable relationships between boarders um, and boarders and their landladies. Here's one of Gunn's types, the boarding house where you're expected to make love to the landlady. Lady. Uh, worst of all, if you believe the various accounts, uh, was the food. It was either terrible, uh, humorous wrote about her suit butter, damaged coffee, ancient bread and antediluvian pies. And here you have a very uh, famous song, which you can still find um, on the internet, various versions at the boarding house where I live. Everything is growing old, long gray hairs upon the butter. Uh, everything is green with mold. When the dog died, we had sausage. When the cat died, catnip tea. When the landlord died, I left there. <laughs> Spare ribs were too much for me. Um, so the food was either um, unpalatable uh, or barely adequate to keep body alive, um, or it was both. Now, these observations, whoops were not entirely fictional. Uh, they, uh, there was often a considerable gap between boarders' expectations and the rents they were willing or able to pay. And at the same time, and Lev pointed this out beautifully, uh, boarding houses uh, were very much defined in contrast to actually what was much a much newer phenomenon, and that was the idealized uh, middle-class home. And so uh, homes, at least uh, as imagined, and you, this, this image, of course, um, is a romanticized version. Not everybody had houses on a lake um, uh, or, um, and it wasn't always sunny and so on and so forth. And I also love that this is um, middle age. Um, so I guess 30 was the new 60 in the 19th century. Uh, but homes were ideally private. They were suburban. They were removed from the world of politics, the public and work. And, and here you see this uh, where the husband and father is, has come home and the wife, uh, the children, um, and the dog are, are, in, are in the house. And this is a wonderful depiction of what historians have called separate spheres, where the idea that the home was removed uh, from the public um, and especially from the marketplace. Um, okay, so uh, particularly problematic uh, was then uh, the boarding house, because the boarding house uh, was a place uh, where women visibly labored, um, unlike here, where she looks pretty good for, um, you know, having presumably done laundry, cooking, cleaning, etc. And when middle class women, even if they had servants, still worked very, very hard, um, but they were usually depicted as um, ladies of leisure not doing anything at all. Um, not so boarding house keepers who also uh, worked uh, very hard. And the cultural problem was, as many observers saw it, was that they labored for money instead of laboring for love. And here we have Mrs. Flintskin, who is determined 
uh, to squeeze every penny she can out of her poor, pathetic quarters. Um, and here we have the mistress of Starvation Hall, uh, who also is an embodiment of a corrupt place. So in boarding houses, so the cultural logic went, the market invaded what should have been a home. So what I'm really interested in though, although I love this popular culture, it's lots and lots of fun, but what I'm really interested in is maybe the more boring <laughs> parts of the subject. How did actual boarders and boarding housekeepers navigate this cultural context of, of which uh, they were quite aware? And so what I want to do is to turn to four very brief case studies that I think tell us something about the ways in which boarders understood their relationship to boarding and implicitly to home. And so my argument is very simple. On the inside, as well as the outside, it was not always easy to distinguish a boarding house from a home. So I'm going to begin uh, with a woman named Susan Parsons Brown, uh, who was a school teacher in Boston and who lived at a boarding house at 34 Oxford Street. Uh, she was originally from Epson, New Hampshire. Uh, she was a former Lowell Mill girl, so she might have lived in that first boarding house I showed you. And she uh, had a very active social life. When she moved to Boston, there were all kinds of people there with Epson connections, friends and relatives. So she was hardly alone um, in the city. But her primary attachments were to what she called our family at 34, the inhabitants of her boarding house. Now, I have no idea really what 34 Oxford Street looked like. Uh, it, is, it is no longer. Uh, Oxford Street is now in Boston's Chinatown. And even the buildings that are there, which uh, preservationists are right now desperately trying to save, uh, date from the 1870s um, and 1880s. If I suspect um, 34 Oxford Street looks something like this, 36 Kingston Street, which was not far away. But I don't know for sure, but I do know that it was uh, a row house. Brown probably chose 34, as she called it, because its keeper, Mrs. Haskell, was not a stranger, but the daughter of a family friend. And Haskell was a recent migrant to the city um, herself. And Brown uh, joined a very crowded household. And here is an advertisement that Mrs. Haskell placed. Uh, and even as early in the, as the 1850s, she is very much participating in what was a series of, I guess I'd call them cliches of boarding house uh, advertisements. Uh, and here she's saying a quiet home in a central location, uh, which it was, where there are but few boarders. Claiming to house few boarders or no other boarders uh, was often more of a marketing tactic um, as a statement of fact. Uh, and despite the language of her advertisement, Haskell housed more than a few. Uh, in addition to Brown, her boarders included two married couples, at least seven young clerks and salesmen who worked in the city's commercial downtown. So here is Oxford Street, and they would have worked. Um, in this area here, and um, the school at which Brown, Susan Brown taught was here. So good location. Okay. So seven young clerks and salesmen, a Miss Richardson, who seems to have been an invalid and a servant. So at least 15 people. Now we don't know the exact number of bed chambers uh, at 34, but here's a kind of common row house plan, uh, which these are the upper floors where there would have been uh, what were called bed chambers. We would call them bedrooms, um, but I'm going to be 19th century and call them bed chambers. 
So there were at least uh, eight, um, maybe if you wanted to make this uh, sitting room uh, a bedchamber, nine. Uh, but this meant that a lot of people um, had to share rooms and they likely uh, shared beds as well. And again, this is from Gunn's Physiology, uh, where he writes about the problem of being thrown together uh, with a roommate who snored, or as he put it in his text, uh, spent all night moaning like a lovelorn dove. Um, so he's depicted uh, the, <laughs> the, the bed mate as a, as, as a bird. Um, okay, so there were more than a few orders. Now, although she always referred to her landlady as Mrs. Haskell, or Mrs. H, uh, Brown acted very much like a sister or a daughter uh, to her. Uh, for a time, she and Mrs. Haskell slept in the same room, uh, which might not have meant uh, that they were, might not have been an indication of intimacy, uh, might have simply been practical. There might not have been any place else to put her. But she accompanied Haskell on bonnet hunting expeditions, on social calls, Fourth of July fireworks. She ran errands for Mrs. Haskell. And when Haskell faced financial difficulties, Brown lent her money. Uh, she didn't hesitate, though, to charge Haskell interest. Yet Brown forged relationships, not just with her landlady, but with the whole of what she called the family at 34. And in fact, she carefully recorded the arrival of new boarders and the departure of old ones in her diary. Each New Year's Day, she took an inventory of the household's inhabitants, noting that the family at 34 consists of, or our family at 34 consists of. And so her nomenclature, I would argue, was more than merely semantic um, because the inhabitants of 34 did act something like a family. Sometimes the entire household joined together for May Day excursions, New Year's games of blind men's bluff, or an occasional popcorn party. Now they had popcorn in the 19th century. On one New Year's Day, the boarders gathered in the parlor for a presentation in Mrs. Haskell's honor. Now, some of Brown's relationships, and she was uh, 32 at the time she came to Boston, uh, with male boarders were friendships. She took a sisterly interest, for example, in Charles Dodge, a clerk some 10 years her junior. She mended his coats and took pride in his accomplishments. Her interest in other boarders uh, was not so sisterly. For a brief period, a courtship with Alexander Lyle, one of the dry goods salesmen, blossomed. He and Brown sat in the parlor chatting until the wee hours on several occasions. But the romance fizzled, and Brown wrote in her diary, Mr. Lyle left boarding here. She double underlined it. Shortly thereafter, Brown identified another prospect, a new boarder named Alexander Forbes and a recent immigrant from Scotland. The 21-year-old Forbes, a clerk um, in a, down, a downtown dry goods store, quickly joined Brown's social circle. Soon he was accompanying her to church, young men's Christian association meetings and public lectures. And soon Brown and Forbes were chatting in the parlor until the wee hours. Forbes, for his part, scrawled a hasty note to Brown on a scrap of newspaper. Miss Brown, I love you, it read. In December of 1857, Brown obliquely noted that she and Forbes had decided on a question that has been in agitation. In other words, they were engaged. Uh, they married a year and a half later, after a ceremony and a brief honeymoon in Epsom, New Hampshire, they returned to Mrs. Haskell's boarding house to begin married life. So despite the fact that it was a boarding house, Brown considered 34 Oxford Street home and its inhabitants her family. And she must have encountered conventional definitions of home. For example, when she attended a lecture on women and her work, which she pronounced very excellent, Still, home as glorified 
in novels, household manuals, lithographs, and ladies' magazines may have been an unfamiliar concept to her. She'd lived in a boarding house during her eight-month stint as a weaver in Lowell in the 1840s. As a teacher in various New Hampshire towns, she had always boarded with local families. Her own family in Epson took in boarders from time to time. So for Brown, as for many other 19th century Americans, the isolated nuclear family and that idealized home were probably far more alien notions than living in the midst of the assorted and mostly transient individuals who made up that family at 34. Within two years of the Forbes's marriage, Mrs. Haskell gave up boarding housekeeping and the couple in keeping with social expectations moved to quote, our own house. But our own house was not exactly what you might expect. Strictly speaking, it was not their own house, but one they rented for $550 a year, nor was it the private dwelling that a term such as our own house might imply. Instead, it was a boarding house of their own. And here I should point out that, especially in urban areas, most landladies rented the boarding houses they ran. They did not necessarily own them. So now I'm going to move to Troy, New York, um, and a very different boarder, a woman named Catherine Thorne. Now, boarding houses tended to attract people at particular stages of life. Uh, most often young single men and women and newly married couples. But Catherine Thorne was different. For her, the boarding house provided a refuge in old age. So she was born in England. Uh, she was the wife of a prominent uh, Troy, New York physician, uh, a state representative and city mayor. And she ended up living much of her life in Troy. And in 1880, some five years after the death of, death of her husband, 78-year-old Thorne moved to the Clark House, which was a fashionable boarding house located just a few blocks from her former home. And this is Clark House on the left. Um, and it is it actually was purpose-built. It's alternately described in city directories as a boarding house and as a small hotel. And it does still exist. Uh, here it is. It was in danger of being torn down. And now it is this kind of uh, gentrified uh, collection of restaurants and shops on the bottom level. And um, I can't remember. I think they're condos on the top. Um, so um, some of the dilemmas of preservation embodied in this building. Um, all right. So, but for Thorne, rather than inhabit an old age home, uh, there were such in the 19th century or her own private home, uh, she, she decided to choose the sociability of a boarding house. She was a widow and her only son had died. So when she moved to Clark House, she joined a multi-generational household as its eldest resident. And she would remain there. In fact, she outlived her landlady, Helen Price, uh, until her death in 1890 at the age of 89. Now, like the household Mrs. Haskell managed some 30 years earlier, Mrs. Price's boarding house included a mix of single men, most of them clerks and salesmen, single women, mostly teachers, married couples, and widows, uh, though this was on a somewhat larger scale. Uh, Clark House contained about 30 boarders compared to the 13 or so at 34 Oxford Street. And of course you can see it's a lot bigger. Thorne had a very active social life. Only icy winter sidewalks and occasional illness prevented her from making daily social calls. And numerous people called for her at Clark House as well. Yet much calling went on inside Clark House. And in the evenings, boarders often gathered. Uh, here is a page uh, from Thorne's diary and a transcription of part of it, which describes a party in the parlor and sociable boarders. So boarders would gather to make music. Uh, Thorne played the piano while others sang, to gossip, 
and to play fiercely competitive card games of cribbage, casino, whist, and physique. Thorne's closest relationship at Clark House was with Fanny Whitmore, music teacher in her early 40s, who accompanied Thorne to Sunday services at the Unitarian Church, to church fairs and socials, and to numerous musical and theatrical entertainment. Yet Thorne's friendship with Whitmore was also her most difficult relationship. Disagreements, misunderstandings, and slights abounded. Whenever she and Whitmore were not on speaking terms, which was fairly often, Thorne was cut out of whatever social gatherings Whitmore convened. It's kind of like junior high. These spats were usually short-lived. On one occasion, for example, Thorne noted that their solemn silence to each other ended as my quarrels usually do in a makeup. That evening, they once again played casino. Thorne had a similarly trying, though somewhat less intense relationship with David Briggs, a curmudgeonly bachelor and co-owner of a collar factory. And Troy, New York, by the way, was a major manufacturing center of detachable collars. Um, men um, didn't change their shirts very often, but they changed their collars. Um, okay, so yeah, Briggs, like Thorne, is a member of the local elite. Briggs's iconoclasm and general grouchiness inspired Thorne's irritation and her affection. He brought her newspaper articles he thought she would find interesting and advised her on her own submission to the Troy Daily Times. Thorne, in turn, advised Briggs on matters of the heart. Mr. Briggs appealed to me about sending his monogram to some lady, she wrote, advised him to beware. Although she called Clark House her home, Thorne never described her housemates as her family. Yet they were somehow special to her, a fact best captured in her description of what they were not. In Thorne's parlance, callers who came from outside the boarding house were visitors from abroad. Was Clark House a family? Like 34, Despite the transience of its population, Clark House functioned something like one. When Sarah Buell, an invalid, died, her body was laid out in Clark House's parlor. Conveniently, the household included uh, an undertaker among its boarders. Mrs. Price, the landlady, nursed Thorne when she was unwell and brought her meals in bed. Whitmore and Briggs, among others, went for the doctor and picked up medicines, including a bottle of port. And all the people I'm going to describe here were teetotalers, to the best of my knowledge, but it was perfectly acceptable even for total abstinence temperance supporters to use alcohol for medicinal purposes. Um, and Thorne um, certainly seems to have done so um, on more than one occasion. Now, to be sure, Clark House was not a paradise for Thorne. Her quarrels with Miss Whitmore caused her much distress. And even though she was surrounded by fellow boarders, she was often lonely and melancholy, lost in thought about her departed husband and son, or as she called them, her poor lost boys. But if in the end, Clark House did not constitute Thorne's family, Perhaps it came close. David Briggs, her housemate for nearly a decade, was among her pallbearers. So now I'm going to turn to Timothy O'Donovan, a young single man and therefore the most typical border um, of the borders I'm discussing. Uh, and O'Donovan uh, was also a victim of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he was a lineman on uh, the Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and St. Louis Railroad, and sometime in the spring or winter of 1879, he lost one of his legs um, in an unspecified railroad accident. Nevertheless, misfortune propelled him into a white collar job. After a period of training, he became a telegraph operator and ticket agent at a railroad station just west of Pittsburgh, and eventually secured an additional job as the station's agent for an express company. It's always going well 
but then he made what he came to consider a grave mistake. In 1883, he joined the Brotherhood of Telegraphers, uh, a union, labor union, and joined that year's unsuccessful telegrapher strike. His participation coupled with his threatening letter to a supervisor lost him both his jobs. And after a series of unsuccessful local interviews, he secured a position as a telegraph operator on the East Coast. So finding a new job meant leaving his family and his Irish Catholic community behind. Yet O'Donovan was not necessarily a provincial. He was a son of illiterate immigrant parents. He received at least a grammar school education, but he continued his education long after his formal schooling ended. He read Malthus, Ricardo, Hume, Descartes, Montesquieu, de Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill, and Adam Smith. He supplemented his education in political economy with scientific and medical texts and books on grammar, penmanship, and mechanical drawing. He really was a quite extraordinary individual. And actually, all the people that I'm talking about here are really extraordinary individuals. Um, that really, um, it's really worth thinking about ordinary people's experiences and reading O'Donovan's diary as well as Thorns and Browns um, convinces me of the importance of doing so. Um, however, <laughs> Donovan, as you might expect, had a rather high opinion of himself, and he often found that other people did not live up to his standards. And this was certainly the case when he moved east and had to live in a series of boarding houses. And over Connecticut, his first posting, he termed a dismal, dreary place. Boarding in Andover was even drearier. His landlady was a disagreeable, unctuous looking person. At the table, he found repulsive looking bread, unfit to eat, other food still worse. Ugh. Luckily, he was transferred to another station after only a few days, and life improved at East Thompson, Connecticut. There he stayed with a nice family who provided right good board. He even briefly entertained thoughts of romance for he found the two sisters with whom he boarded right well-educated, good appearance and manners. Such musings proved short-lived for less than a week later, O'Donovan was transferred to the Western Massachusetts town of Bolton where he was repelled by his landlady who sold whiskey on the sly. Then he was reassigned to the station at Willimantic, Connecticut, Milltown and Railroad Hub, where he spent the duration of his East Coast stay. At Willimantic, he boarded for a few weeks with a Mrs. Harris, but quickly decided to move on, neatly summing up his reasons in the pages of his diary. Poor board and accommodations, high priced, undesirable acquaintances in people and boarders. He settled in at Mrs. Taft's, which on first sight looked much better. And again, these uh, structures have not survived, but he was on Center Street. By the way, Center Street also was a victim of urban renewal. So Center Street is not there e anymore either. Uh, but he was, he was somewhere here and here's the railroad depot. So conveniently located. And he would have been in one of these houses um, along here. Okay, at Mrs. Taft's. Okay, so Mrs. Taft's kind of looked like it was gonna work out, um, but predictably, uh, the establishment failed uh, to live up to his ex expectations. Boarding and family do not work so well as I find after a time. I have a good deal of contempt for family and several of the boarders. Uh, then he explained why, and there's just pages and pages in his diary of what he thought of his borders, uh, his fellow borders. Here are some examples. Anderson is a stupid, bigoted chucklehead. Mr. Morrill, a hollow-chested, pigeon-toed, womanish, conceited, talkative, and a Methodist. The unmarried Crittenden sisters, Supposed teachers, he scoffed, 
were supercilious and vain, having but meager education and no ideas of manners but what they have gathered from etiquette books. One he considered good looking, the other ugly, mainly because she insisted on keeping her nose in the air. Dr. Hoagland was a very small headed hangdog looking fellow. W.T. Gardner was a little monkey like fellow. The landlady's husband, a devotee of spiritualism, in which he has stupid, undoubting confidence, was a senile, decrepit old man, but prides himself on his enlightenment and independence, though he is henpecked. So Donovan had very little, little good to say about almost anyone, and we might conclude that he was the one with his nose in the air. And I suspect that the other boarders disliked him as much as he disliked them. Okay, so O'Donovan was over the top, but he wasn't necessarily unique because much of the transience of boarding house life reflected boarders' search for congenial companions. Unfortunately for O'Donovan, there wasn't a lot of choice in Willimantic. And O'Donovan did eventually form relationships that didn't look so different from those at 34 Oxford Street and Clark House during the six months he lived at Mrs. Taft's. Mrs. Page, a very small, plain old woman, frequently visited with him and gave him stenography lessons. O'Donovan liked her despite the fact that she too believed in spiritualist manifestation and kindred nonsense. For reasons on which he did not elaborate, he bestowed his approval on Bella Brown, a dressmaker, about the best of them. S.C. Wheeler was a good-hearted and honest fellow. Mr. Knox, the manager of the Willimantic Station, was a saucy, good-natured fellow from whom O'Donovan parted with some regret. These bright spots aside, O'Donovan never described his boarding houses as homes. He never considered himself a member of the family. And of course, O'Donovan was much farther from home, both geographically and culturally, than Susan Brown or Catherine Thorne. An Irish Catholic, even an Irish Catholic intellectual, was bound to be an, be an outsider in boarding houses populated by the Yankee petty bourgeoisie. Boarding house life itself was foreign to him. He had never, as far as we can tell, lived in one before. Even his parents never seemed to have taken in boarders, so they surely could have used the money. And so ironically, the Irish Catholic, Catholic O'Donovans most closely approximated what we tend to think of as a middle-class Protestant ideal. After six months in Wellomantic and nine months away from home, O'Donovan had enough of the Northeast and enough of boarding. Armed with favorable reference letters from his East Coast employers, he left for Pittsburgh, even though no job awaited him. Um, eventually, he did find work. Once again, as a ticket agent, he hired a contractor to build him a house and four years later got married. By 1910, he was running a newsstand assisted by two of his children. Successive census takers may have erred by describing his wife, Lucinda, as having no occupation. But if she supplemented the family income, she evidently did not do so by taking in boarders. So more ways than one, Timothy O'Donovan never left home again. So my final case study returns to pre-Civil War Boston. And this is a story of a pair of boarders, a married couple named Ellen and William, who were 25 years old, that was Ellen, and 26 years old, that was William, when they moved to Mrs. Hayden's Beacon, Beacon Hill boarding house, um, which does still exist. Now, it was not unusual, and we saw this with um, the Forbeses, for young married couples to board, although cultural commentators frowned upon this practice. Uh, wives especially were accused of laziness, of not wanting to fulfill their domestic duties, and inadvertently encouraging their husbands to look for comforts elsewhere because they were not giving their husbands the comforts of home. 
Mrs. Hayden's uh, boarding house wasn't all that far uh, from Susan Brown's. Here's 34 Oxford Street. Here's 66 Phillips Street on Beacon Hill. Um, although it was uh, somewhat smaller, um, at least in terms of numbers of borders. Uh, Mrs. Hayden only had five borders in addition to Ellen and William. Um, all of the additional borders were young men, a clerk, two tailors, and three tenders who may have worked in her husband's clothing store. Like Ellen and William, who hailed from Georgia, most of the boarders were Southerners by birth, as were the Haydens. Now, boarding houses, um, as you may have gathered, uh, were places that allowed for a certain degree of social mixing. New, Englander, New Englanders might rub elbows with Scots, Irish Catholics with Methodists. Yet, except for a small number of establishments run by radical abolitionists, they rarely cross the color line. Mrs. Hayden's boarding house was no exception. Apart from a white servant, all of its inhabitants, including Ellen and William, were black. We don't know if Ellen and William complained about the food or their fellow boarders. We don't know if Harriet Hayden acted like Mrs. Flintskin or the mistress of Starvation Hall. African-American newspapers publish the same kinds of humorous accounts as general circulation newspapers did, but they also celebrated the respectability of black boarding house keepers and praised their labor. And indeed, the work of African-American landladies like Hayden assumed a special significance. In an era when segregation remained the norm, even in the North, Black boarding houses provided the vital function of offering lodgings to travelers who otherwise might go without shelter. African-American boarding houses in cities like Boston also sheltered fugitive slaves, like Harriet Hayden's lodgers, William and Ellen Craft. Uh, and this is the title page uh, to their narrative uh, to escape slavery, Ellen, who could pass for white, dressed as a man, and William pretended to be her servant. So here is um, Ellen um, dressed in her disguise. Harriet Hayden's husband, Lewis, has received the most attention from historians. He was famous for threatening to blow up his house um, and the slave catchers who were pursuing the crafts uh, with it. Yet, I would argue that Harriet Hayden's work was of equal importance because in her daily life, she transformed the mundane labors of housekeeping, cooking, sweeping, scrubbing, laundering, emptying chamber pots into acts of anti-slavery resistance. We might in fact term what she did revolutionary housekeeping. What do these four case studies add up to? What strikes me is that all of the residents featured here were places where people lived together, ate together, socialized together, and occasionally mourned together. What I also find striking is that far from tolerating vice, well-functioning boarding house communities sustain the good character of their inhabitants by showing, for example, that men and women could live together in propriety, if not necessarily in harmony. And in fact, in an era when a female boarding house was a euphemism for a brothel, a respectable boarding house was one that was heterosocial. Social. And that is precisely why employers who built boarding houses like that one we saw at Lowell for female operatives or superintendents of homes for working girls took great pains to publicize their constant moral policing of their inhabitants. If nothing else, these accounts underscore boarding houses remarkable flexibility. They served as venues for courtship old age homes, refuges from slavery, 
They testify, I think, to the many ways in which people created surrogate families, or maybe not even surrogate families, the way they created families, we might say. They challenge nostalgic narratives that evoke traditional families and households, for they reveal 19th century living arrangements were no less varied than our own. Ultimately, boarding houses attractions even for the supposedly homebound middle classes, show us that communities of strangers might make houses into homes. So if we're in search of an extended family, we might look to the past as well as to the present and the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. That was great. And uh, I think it left me with, with quite a kind of contemporary sense uh, of these stories. I mean, I think you, you painted a very vivid picture of kind of alternative conceptions and sensations of these social senior, uh, spheres. Um, but there was this sort of very familiar uh, sounding needs for sociability, for flexibility, and even the complaints. I mean, I was thinking that they were they kind of sounded like, well, the complaints, but also the, the positive notes were sort of like wordy Airbnb reviews. I mean, they just they <laughs> felt like the words were different, but like we've heard all this before. Um, but I guess that the, it, it all sort of circled around this question or this discomfort around paying for or selling sort of social or, or even kind of intimacy. Um, so while the public maybe thinks of a question or two. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, as, a, as a starting point, a kind of question about the context um, in terms of what else was, was available at the time, like inns or sort of the beginning of hotels, uh, what kind of niche did boarding houses fill? And, and does, does this relate to why boarding house ladies were so targeted for criticism? Well, they were certainly the most economical option and and I should say that they were absolutely essential, at least in cities, um, for urban growth, um, especially in housing um, young men and women who had you know, paid employment. Uh, they, these uh, were people who needed somebody uh, to, to cook their meals and, and do their housekeeping for them because Housekeeping was really a, a full-time job. Uh, there were, I mean, boarding houses were not the only evil other. <laughs> so for example, um, what came to be called tenements, a tenement used to be just any sort of building, but it quickly uh, by the late 19th century gained um, this notion of this uh, sort of unhealthy, overcrowded, um, immoral place. Uh, hotels too, very wealthy people might live in hotels. The original hotels um, were, uh, did not uh, include kitchen or, or, in, uh, or original apartment, original hotels were called apartment hotels. Um, they didn't include kitchens. Um, uh, women didn't do their own housework and they got a lot of criticism. And then you, so you see by the late 19th century, the emergence of apartments, uh, which had kitchens uh, and which uh, were somewhat less suspect because they were more like homes on a, on a miniature scale. So certainly there were alternatives, but uh, boarding houses, uh, were really the, um, the most convenient and most economical. And, and again, these complaints about the food, the complaints about bed bugs and dirt and so on and so forth um, have uh, you know, some bearing in reality uh, simply because uh, these were very impoverished economies. Yeah, I felt like that, that sort of image you showed of the, of the beginning of the idealized family home actually prefigured later uh, critiques of tenements because it was sort of the perspective and the way it was drawn. It was like an impossibly large, airy space, which continued outside with the, the sort of park uh, lake landscape. I mean, it's it's a very unrealistic um, picture. Uh, I guess, what would you say was the sort of high watermark of boarding house culture or, or and, and what led to their decline? I would say probably the late 19th century, the Gilded Age was the high watermark. Uh, by the 
1890s and certainly by the early 20th century, you begin to see more of what were called lodging houses where you rented the, the room, but you didn't receive board and you didn't receive housekeeping services. So you had greater privacy, you ate your meals at a, at a restaurant um, and you didn't have nosy landladies or other people peeking in your room. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that by the early 20th century, there's this notion that arises of the lodger evil. And so, and then all these social reformers are writing about how great boarding houses were. They missed the old fashioned boarding house. And, and it's really funny because if you read what people were writing about the old fashioned boarding house in the 19th century, it was hardly flattering. And people with greater means would then um, move to, to apartments. Um, boarding houses do continue. Um, they continue um, even much longer than I thought. I gave a talk, I believe in 2009, 2010. And it's one of these times when you really wish that you had been invited to give that talk before you wrote the book, because I would have, I think, written a very different book. Um, it, uh, my talk um, attracted a very large contingent of um, people who were over 65 or so. Um, and many of whom had relatives who had kept boarding houses or who um, you know, had grown up in boarding houses. And I was, I was going, you know, I was just like, oh my goodness. And I kept saying, uh, you know, did they leave behind letters? Did they leave behind diaries? Well, no. But but it was very you know obviously um, they, they were they had were not alive in the 19th century. But I would say that it's uh, as people as privacy and and privacy is a really difficult concept to define. Um, it was very elastic and very flexible. But as people conceive of a need for greater privacy, they head for either lodging houses or apartments, or of course in. Uh, especially in post World War II period in the U.S., um, their own homes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think that privacy is a nice connection to this um, other question um, from Torsten in the chat. I'll just read it out. Thanks for this wonderful talk, shedding light on the lived experiences and values of boarding house owners and residents. You ended by speaking about boarding houses as refuges. And I wondered if in your research, you came across evidence about boarding houses as refuges from normative sexuality, for example, same-sex relationships, to the extent that this can be made out from the sources in the absence of our contemporary language around sexual orientation and gender identity. I didn't find anything um, in my own research, um, but George Chauncey's wonderful book, G Gay New York, um, suggests um, that boarding houses uh, that, um, that housed um, uh, people who uh, would eventually be called um, gay and lesbian were very important parts um, of, of a developing uh, gay culture in the city. And I should also say that boarding houses uh, sorted themselves out in all kinds of interesting ways um, by class, by ethnicity, by race, by occupation, sometimes by religious affinity, uh, sometimes uh, vegetarians <laughs> would have their own boarding houses because they would get vegetarian food, uh, people of particular political persuasions. Uh, so uh, I think that was part of it. But yes, I, I think that's absolutely um, was the case. And I'd refer you to Chauncey's wonderful book. Thank you for the, your answer and Torsten for the great question. Um, were there attempts to kind of uh, separate uh, profit from the equation? I mean, kind of public boarding houses or were they called something else? Uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, certainly uh, if you wanted um, to have a certain kind of boarding house, you might need to get a license. So uh, you could say, if you didn't want to do that, you could say that you were offering boarding in a private family. Uh, and at first I thought, oh, this is sort of uh, a question of quantity. Uh, but then uh, Susan Brown, who becomes Susan Forbes, uh, her diary once again saved me. <laughs> she wrote, once she and her husband are running their own boarding house, she writes in her diary that she placed an ad in the Boston transcript. So I go and look. 
and there she's advertising boarding in a private family. Uh, well, her private family had about seven to 10 unrelated people. Uh, at the same time, you see um, boarding houses run um, by Irish immigrant women that might have one or two boarders and they're called boarding houses. So I think, you know, this whole question of semantics is really interesting. And it's also very interesting that you can see landladies playing this game. Um, so very elite boarding housekeepers would say they were hosting visiting friends um, when these friends were actually paying strangers. Uh, private family, house where there are but few boarders. Um, so they're, they're clearly aware of the way uh, they're perceived um, and, uh, and, they're, and they're fighting back. Um, but, but certainly uh, places like, for example, sailors boarding houses would have to get licensed and they might be considered public. But they're, the whole language of public and private is also very, very vexed and means very different, meant very different things to different people. Yeah, uh, for me, that was one of the, my, the most interesting things of your talk was sort of getting, starting to feel the difference in how these words like public and private and intimate and uh, were clearly being used at a different time. Um, I have maybe another question, but this is just a, a warning to our to our public that we've, we've had an hour of Wendy's time and I don't want to, to push it too much. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or on YouTube where I'm also checking uh, and when I'll ask Wendy. Um, I was curious if, if you want to sort of, if you have an argument or you want to speculate on what you think sort of remains with us from, from some of these debates around boarding house culture, what kind of influence you think they, they've had that we can still feel? Well, uh, you, for example, pointed out Airbnb. Uh, and I believe it, la the last time I checked, nearly half of Airbnb hosts um, were, are women. I'm sure I know Airbnb has not done well uh, during the pandemic. So this was a pre-pandemic. Um, college dormitories, co-housing. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of uh, situations that I think um, are quite are quite similar. Uh, bed and breakfast, assuming that there are the, the, there are still such things. Um, so uh, I think uh, as, as well, um, where you know, we are seeing um, more and more interest in intentional communities. For example, I have a, a neighbor who's uh, planning uh, to retire to one in Colorado, um, and he's raising, uh, hoping to raise the money to build this uh, community where people will have their own houses, but there will also be common gathering places and it's supposed to be multi-generational and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, we, we see it there um, as well. And, and of course, almost nobody lives in these ideal homes. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, children move back in with their parents after college. Uh, people end up taking in relatives for various reasons. So we have this notion of what the family is supposed to look like, but I think it's, I think it's something like 25% or maybe fewer uh, families in the US today have that kind of traditional you know, male breadwinner uh, nuclear structure. So I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but, but I think what's stubbornly persistent is this notion of the ideal family, um, you know, that, that we cling to, even though we know it doesn't exist. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Et, uh, bye bye. Thank you very much.